have you found them? Because I know you guys will do a long form piece and then a video, and so you're constantly doing and promoting stories in different ways. Have you found that there are certain outlets, like maybe Twitter is better for the video and Facebook's better for the story? Yeah, I know. It's a really good question. And we've definitely found that, um, you know, there are certain kind of video curators out there. Um, you know, MediaStorm is a really fantastic, uh, you know, video multimedia shop. And they have a blog where they'll curate really cool video pieces. So anytime they pick up one of our videos on their blog, it's, it's amazing because their audience are these like devotees of, of the video form. Um, same thing is true with, you know, long form articles when longform.org or longreads.org, which are two, you know, really influential long form content curators pick up our, our stuff. They send us really, really quality traffic. Um, you know, Huffington Post, they send us a lot of traffic, but it tends to be not as high quality, you know, they, which, which is fine. We, we want traffic at this point. Um, we want eyeballs. But, you know, they don't tend to spend, spend as much time on the site, I think, because, you know, the Huffington Post user, you know, just kind of generally speaking here, wants something quicker. You know, they're kind of surfing around. They want cool little little pieces, whereas they might come to our site and see, oh, this is cool, but it's 5,000 words. So I think that's an opportunity for us to then Maybe even, you know, when someone comes from Huffington Post, flash a message to them saying, hey, welcome Huffington Post, you know, user, you know, we value your time here. If you only have three minutes, check out these short stories we've done. If you have more time, check out our most popular stuff. So I think, you know, we need to do a lot more in terms of testing and figuring out, you know, what are the best curators for certain types of media and how can we then channel those users they send to us into the right spot on the site so, you know, we make the best use of their time and aren't wasting their time. Absolutely, and I'd love to talk to you for a moment about user engagement. Would you rather know I have a tight-knit group of readers who read every single story, watch every single short film on Narratively, or would you rather have a wider audience that comes in specifically when they're interested? So it's a really, it's a, it's a tough question, Jenna. I think, you know, at this point in the game, um, you know, we're really proud of this kind of devoted group of, of users with, that we've built. And, you know, those are the people that share our stories. Those are the people that I'm, I'm sure, you know, pledge to our Kickstarter campaign in the very early days. Uh, in many senses, there's a big overlap between our, our readers and our writers. You know, a lot of, I mean, it's one and the same in some cases, because these are people that helped us build this from the get-go and spread the word through all their networks. And now they, you know, they want to see us succeed. Um, I think we can, uh, you know, as we move forward, we actually have plans to roll out a, a paid subscription. Um, not to say we're going to be putting a paywall on the site, but, you know, we're going to be adding some value and creating kind of a, a membership on the site. And I think our, our sort of devoted users who come and spend 10, 15 minutes on the site or more, you know, per, per visit, those are the ones that are going to want to buy this subscription and, 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 and engage with us. They're the ones who come to our event. So that's phenomenally important. And I want to do more and more to cultivate that group, give them more value. And of course, you know, grow that grow those numbers too at the same time you know we're not just reliant you know i don't think we'll, we'll be just reliant on subscriptions you know we, we want to grow our, our ad sales we want to grow everything else and so I, by that token and of course our exposure uh and so i think it's very important for us to do stories uh and partner with people like buzzfeed which we have a vertical on the buzz or excuse me a widget on the buzzfeed long form vertical uh and so getting people like that to kind of send us traffic and because at the end of the day our hope is that you know, as we sort of grow our numbers and, and, you know, or just kind of general audience, some of those people will, like you, Jenna, kind of be taken aback at how beautiful the work is we're doing. And maybe we'll convert them into becoming this kind of devoted audience who then will buy a subscription and, and kind of become a part of this core team. But I think, you know, we, we definitely want to grow the numbers but while well, at the same time maintaining our, our core um, and, and making sure that we're, you know, we're keeping people happy and, and giving them and, and, can, and, and, of course, moving in the right direction the whole time. All right, so let's shift, uh, let's shift gears for a second, Noah, and present the million-dollar question. What's your untold story? My untold story, wow. it's um, a good question. I mean, my untold story, I think, is that, um, you know, I've always just been a, uh, well, I'm an only child, for starters. I'm a lefty, so that's something you guys might not have known. Um, and, um, you know, I, I grew up in Connecticut. I grew up in Stanford, Connecticut, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a family that, you know, of, of artists and entrepreneurs, of, 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 you know, creative types that always just kind of pursued their passions, sometimes to the chagrin of their, of their significant others who are a little nervous, I think, about money coming in. Um, but my, my mom's a, a, an educator, a teacher. She's been so for 41 years. Um, she at one point launched kind of a, um, a startup herself, uh, you know, kind of a, an education, SAT prep enrichment center. 
my dad is an artist and, and does kind of modern day blacksmithing, you know, ornamental iron work and, and does some really beautiful work. Uh, I have artists and, and, or excuse me, uncles and, and grandparents who were artists. And at the same time, some of them were like doctors on the side. But so I always came from a, you know, a, a family and the kind of a belief system that, you know, if you put your mind to something, you could, you could make it happen. And I think you know, since I was a little kid, I've always been very, I've always loved storytelling. I've always, you know, as you can tell, I'm, I'm a talker. You know, I love, I love, I love talking to people and hearing their stories too. But I've always had ideas to, and and wanted to build things. And um, you know, and, and I think where I am now in, in my career, it's just kind of been this. Really, nothing was planned. You know, I always just kind of, you know, I've been in kind of the professional world now for you know eight or so years, and and you know, from CBS News to you know Univision to the Times to other you know small community outlets, and I've always just really just followed where the opportunities were and followed where my passion lied. And I, and I feel like it just kind of worked out now to the point where, you know, everything I've done has been this beautiful building block to eventually do what I'm doing today. And, and, and I wish I could say it was, uh, you know, kind of planned. Um, cause I look at people who have these plans and they go here and save this company for a while and then go here and it's, it's great. I mean, it works out well. I, I didn't have that. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes like, I think it's wishful thinking. I was lucky in many senses of the word because I was able to kind of just create these opportunities and go places that inevitably would kind of inform who I was and what I was meant to do. But, um, you know, I think, I think a lot of it is kind of this, uh, I don't know if I really believe in destiny or, or you know, something was meant to happen, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really been kind of intriguing for me just sometimes taking a step back and seeing like, you know, these decisions I've made and uh, not always linear, you know, sometimes going, going from CBS News uh, to like a chain of weekly newspapers and, you know, to some people it might not have been this logical path like, oh, you're, you know, instead of climbing that ladder, you're going to a much smaller market. But for me, it was, it was becoming a, you know, going from being a small fish in a huge sea to being this big fish in, in a pretty small pond and being able to really flourish and grow. And, and I think that's my advice I always give to, to kind of, you know, other entrepreneurs and of course other journalists too is just, you know, follow where your interests are. Um, you know, not that it's always going to work out in the end. You have to be willing to kind of accept failure and, and, and pivot when you can. But I think if you work hard and, and, and look in some, you know, untraditional places, I think you might, you might be kind of happy where you end up. What an answer, Noah. <laughs> Give That's people, my untold story. <laughs> story that will definitely give people a lot to think about. Yeah. It's been an extraordinary year for your team, and I think when they're led by someone like you with that kind of attitude, it's impossible not to have great success. Yeah. Let's start out with your nomination as one of Time's best websites this year. Really a huge, huge accomplishment, so congratulations on that. What site were you most excited to be featured with? Wow, it's a good question. I mean, I think you know, looking through that list, I was, I was, I was first off. Well, just a step back. I mean, that was. I'm, I'm even getting kind of emotional now, remembering like that moment. I was sitting actually not too far from where I am right now, and a buddy of mine tweeted, like, "Congratulations, Noah Rosen." I'm like, "What is he talking?" I thought it was a joke. He's the kind of kid who jokes around a lot, so I was like, "If he's joking, I'm gonna freaking kill this kid." Um, but I, I realized that it, it was real, and literally just kind of like burst out of tears because it was this affirmation that people had recognized what we did. It wasn't just me and my, you know, amazing group of, of friends and contributors who are working with us, but it was like, you know, people around the world and at time, you know, who put out these amazing lists every year, they recognized it and that must mean something. And, and it was this validation of everything that we had really believed, everything I had believed for, you know, pretty much my whole career. Um, so that was amazing. And then, and of course, you know, after I kind of got over that shock and, and, and amazement, then going through a list. And I think, you know, one that really struck out, stuck out at me was Upworthy. I mean, they're this amazing platform that, you know, they, I mean, they have like, what is it, like 6 million likes on Facebook or something absurd. And, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, clearly it's a different type of content, but I, I actually, I, I go to their site all the time because, you know, it's, it's interesting, compelling stuff, but also looking at how they package it, how they, you know, kind of, uh, you know, compel you as the user to like them on Facebook and sign up for the email and how they present the content. And, and you know, they're doing in a way that's similar to us. I mean, you know, if you go to the site, it's very clean. They're only doing like, they only flash like three or six kind of icon stories at you at a time. And then you can always load more by scrolling down. I think they give you it's hard to, you know, you don't really know it at first because they're so good at flashing these, these, you know, the one story you should you should be the one video you should be checking out today. But if you scroll down on the site, they also package that content into different collections, into different topics, and, and I think even by user or by by uh, by author rather. And and so I think you know we learn a lot from them, and um, 
I actually have a friend who who, who does uh, kind of UX stuff for them, so I'm really excited to pick his brain and figure out, you know, how can we how can we learn from them and how can we, you know, upworthyify or you know a term we use at Narrowville is how can we buzzfeedify this story, you know, while maintaining our integrity and aesthetic, how can we make the story really go viral and make people want to click? So um, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the list goes. I mean, I can go on forever about other people that are on that list and, and the fact that we were only like you know three or four numbers away from upworthy was pretty amazing to me too, um, but you know. Obviously, we were very lucky. Um, you know, it was humbling, and, and clearly, I know full well that there could have been any other, you know, ten thousands of websites that could have been in our place. So it's, you know, it's really amazing that that we were there, and, and you know, that's that's you know, it's pretty much the short of it. I want to talk to you know for a second. Like you said, you've been in journalism for a very long time, and I want to talk to you about the future of journalism. To yeah. a lot of people, journalism is a dying industry, and. When I learned about that in my first journalism class in college, my dad told me that you can either embrace it or evaporate. How are you guys embracing the change at Narratively and saying, you know what, journalism is not dying, it's changing and it's getting even better? Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, I definitely don't think journalism's dying. I think, I think journalism as, you know, my grandfather knew it is certainly dying. I think, um, you know, the days of, of, you know, there being, you know, thousands of, of really successful newspapers, large and small, all across the land, you know, those are, are over. Um, but I think exciting things are happening even with legacy media outlets. I mean, you look at Jeff Bezos' purchase of, um, of the Washington Post and like, wow, that was, you know, when, when, that, when, that, when that deal uh, was announced, you know, they mentioned a lot of old time staffers at the Washington Post newsroom who were like, you know, the death knell had been, you know, struck and people were all upset about it. And, and I was like, "Whoa! This is the most exciting thing in the world because, you know, we're gonna have this infusion of, you know, new technologies and this new mindset, the, the e-commerce, you know, kind of, uh, you know, empire that that Jeff has has created. A lot of what he's learned will be infused into the in the newsroom culture and vice versa. You know, I mean, there could be this world where, uh, you know, there's a copy of the Washington Post in every Kindle you purchase. You know, so there's obviously a lot of synergies there." And I think, so I think now, I think, you know, you're obviously starting to hear that a lot of staffers at the Washington Post are, are starting to realize, wait a minute, there, maybe there's nothing, there's nothing that bad about having a, you know, an owner that has $25 billion in his pocket that could, you know, has the liberty and, and the ability to kind of experiment. And I think we're going to see a lot of that happening, you know, across media, not just at, you know, the Washington Post, but you're, you know, you're seeing it at, at legacy outlets left and right. The New York Times does an amazing job of, of kind of staying relevant and, and, and innovating, um, you know, as much as they possibly can. Um, so I think, you know, when it comes to narratively, I mean, one thing that we really seized on is the, um, you know, this kind of confluence of this changing of philosophies, changing of technologies, you know, obviously the advent of tablets and, and other, you know, the ability to kind of take a story and, and a piece of content with you in your pocket and engage at any given time. Uh, and then, of course, the philosophical shift of people, you know, not necessarily always wanting kind of you know these these headlines coming at them twenty four seven, wanting to to kind of take a step back and and step outside the news cycle, as we like to say. Uh, and so narrowly, we're you know we're really kind of taking that you know a few steps further and saying, you know that old school approach of of producing a beautiful print magazine uh, and having a theme. You know a lot of magazines, of course, for a long time did these themes. Um, so we're doing that stuff. You know with these weekly themes and, and it's kind of one story a day. Um, but then we're infusing that with you know, this social media, um, you know, augmentation and, and the ability to kind of produce a story or a Kickstarter video, whatever it is, and then let the world take over. You know, I mean, the fact that I'm even sitting here talking to you guys is, is pretty remarkable because we did, you know, start with a Kickstarter video or, or an, even further back, start with an idea and the ability that, you know, I had to tell a couple friends about this idea and then the word spread through Facebook and through, you know, word of mouth, of course. And then, you know, it's always, um, you know, it's kind of these, these, these building blocks. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's really amazing how we can, despite the fact that we're using this kind of, you know, the slower storytelling approach, we can pair that with, uh, you know, the ability to let things go viral and the ability to kind of create this, this you know, radically, you know, growing network um, is, is, I think it's pretty cool and, and a fun thing to be a part of. Awesome. So let's look ahead into the future then and back in narratively. And um, you've often described New York as a place with lots of untold stories. So, what story do you want to be? What story do you want New Yorkers to be telling about narratively in ten years? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Chase. Um, you know, I, I think you know for us, it's important that that every New Yorker um, you know knows what we're doing. You know, clearly we have a lot of work to do uh, in that regard. You know, um, but I think 
and it's not just New Yorkers. I think I think you know what what we're getting at here is that you know New York has this you know obviously multitude of of amazing stories that aren't really getting the attention they deserve. But so do cities like San Diego and and you know Saigon and and Berlin and you know and rural towns left and right. So you know every every place has its own story it needs to tell, and those stories will be interesting to you if told in the right way, regardless of whether you live in that town or not. And so what we're getting at now is. You know, using New York as kind of the the entry point, and and you know, and New York, of course, is is unique in that it has this massive crossover appeal. Uh, you know, people have you know for millennia or generations rather, uh, you know, read about New York in books and seen it on films and and traveled here for business and lived here. And so, New York has this kind of you know one of a kind sort of um, you know aesthetic to it that people really want to learn about. And so, I think. You know, it was smart of us, despite the the media saturation in New York. I think it was a smart move for us to kind of launch this product here. Um, but I think you know, ten years from now, you know, I'd love to be at the point, and we will be at the point, I think, where you know we're incorporating stories from all over the globe. Uh, you know, spin a globe and point your finger, and hopefully, we'll have a a story there. And you know, I think it's important for for people in New York to to kind of step outside their world too and say. You know, wow! Like I love narratively. They, they, you know, they kind of made their name telling these stories about our city. But you know what? Wow! Like who knew there was this amazing character in you know the middle of the rainforest in the Amazon? You know, wow! Now I know this guy's story. And so I think you know part of what we're doing is, and, and I think a goal moving forward even more so will be creating this kind of really connected world, and and not just connecting you through you know technology and and through kind of the news, but connecting you through these kind of interpersonal stories that that take place every second everywhere.